Thank you, Pastor. God bless you. Thank you. Hallelujah. Amen. I greet you all in Jesus' name this morning. Amen. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. I'm excited to see you. Uh, you could be in BC, you could be in Disney, whatever. It's vacation time, but you are in the house of the Lord this morning. So give yourself a pom pom this morning. Come on now. Like uh, Pastor JB just said. We are from uh, Edmonton, uh, originally from here. We've been here for 10 years. So we, we moved to Edmonton two years ago. Apostle asked us if we would go and plant a church. We said, if no one else will go, we will go, Papa. So we went, uh, picked our kids, and uh, people thought we were crazy, you know. But uh, we said yes to the call of the Lord. And somebody, when, when you tell people you're from Calgary, they, they think you're crazy that you will come from Calgary to stay in Edmonton. You know, Edmonton is like, is there, any, like, is there anything good that comes from Nazareth, you know? <laughs> you know, but we, we, try, we try to make Edmonton cool, man, you know? So we try by all means, we put videos and all that. We just try to make them cool, Pastor bit. That's what we try to do, you know? But I greet you all in Jesus' name this morning. Before I minister, I'm going to ask my wife to come so she can come and greet the church. And maybe minister one quick song for us. Come, 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 honey. Come and say hi. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My name is Tumelo. For those of you who don't know me, I'm a daughter in the house. This is my home. I'm not a stranger. <laughs> Hallelujah. It's good to be home. I'm sure most of you have seen me for these past few Sundays. Yes, I still live in Edmonton. So <laughs> I've just, I mean, we're just on vacation. We're passing through and uh, we wanted to stop by at home and greet you all. Amen. So I'm going to minister a song before my husband ministers the word. Hallelujah. Amen. Yes, the world will bow down and say you are God. Every man will bow down and say you are king. So let's start right now. Why would we wait? King of glory, fill this place. I just want to be with you. Come on, worship with me, church. I just want to be with you. Oh, King of glory. Just wanna be with you, King of Glory, King of Glory. Feel this place. I just wanna, just wanna be with you. Oh, I just wanna, just wanna be with you. Oh.
We will dance in your presence till you come again. We will sing hallelujah till you come again. We will dance in your presence till you come again. Oh, we Jesus. I'm going to get into the word this morning. Hallelujah. I greet Pastor JB, Pastor Jen in her absence. We tell her we miss her so much. Thank you, Jesus. Pastor Shaka, Dr. Bailey in the house, we greet you, Pastor Sebid, all the pastors and the leader, Pastor Kofi, we greet you in Jesus' name. This morning, I'm going to get into the word. I want to talk about hope that maketh not ashamed, the hope of Jesus Christ that maketh not ashamed. I'm going to read from Romans 5, verse 5, it says, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you. We bless you for your word this morning. Minister through these lips of clay. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So I want to talk about the hope of Jesus that makes us not ashamed. The word to be ashamed means to be embarrassed. Or to, be, or to be guilty because of one's actions, characteristics, or associations. Adam was ashamed because of Eve's action that caused him to disobey God, and he went into hiding. When Adam and Eve sinned, when God came in the cool of the day and he was looking for them, Adam hid because he was ashamed. He was ashamed. So what happens is, when people are ashamed because they have done something wrong, uh, they feel embarrassed, they feel guilty, they go into what I call, they go into hiding. They go into hiding. So believers too go into hiding. I'm reminded of Moses in the Bible. Moses went into hiding after he had killed that Egyptian and he felt so ashamed, he ran away and went into hiding. And he hid and he thought he could, he could hide from God. He hid for 40 years until God found him. You can hide as much as you want, but when God wants you, he will locate you. God has a GPS where you are. He will find you. He is the omnipresent God. He's the omniscient God. He sees everything. He sees you. You can hide from God. You can hide from people, but you can't hide from God. So Moses goes into hiding in the desert, and God locates him. God locates him while he's hiding. So there are believers in this place who are hiding from God. 
I came to expose you this morning. Somebody's hiding from God because they're embarrassed, because they are guilty, because they've made a mistake. The church is the only place, the only place that kills its wounded. The army takes care of its veterans. You go, they have legions and stuff. They take care of those people who went to war. They still tell you people who went to World War II, whatever, in 19, whatever, 40. They still take care of them. But the church is the only place that kills its wounded. When a brother is down, we come and stamp on them. That death is a lie. I came to expose that. I'm just getting started. Somebody's pulling on me right now. I'm, I'm trying to behave myself. So what makes us ashamed? When life does not work out as we expected, we become ashamed. When relationships fail, the enemy makes us ashamed. When stuff that was supposed to work doesn't work, we become ashamed. Because we told people that this thing is supposed to work. We stood before everybody. We had witnesses of this marriage was supposed to work. And when we go through a divorce, now we are ashamed. And the enemy wants you when you are down. The enemy doesn't strike when you are high. He waits when you are down to finish you off. The devil doesn't play fair. And believers want to treat the devil like he's your friend. Oh, you know, we don't need to pray loud, you know. We are in the first world. That devil is a lie. He doesn't care whether you are in the first world. Those spirits will chase you down from Burundi. Those spirits will catch you here in Canada from Zimbabwe. That devil doesn't care, man. <laughs> when things we desire do not transpire, we sit there in despair, in despondence, and we say life was not supposed to turn out this way. I'm sure Moses was there in the desert, and he said, it wasn't supposed to be like this, mama. It wasn't supposed to be like this. I was supposed to be sitting on the throne because he had been raised in the house of Pharaoh. He says, how do I, how, how do I find myself in the desert taking care of sheep? A man who was an heir to the throne is in the desert. That's what life does sometimes. You find yourself in a place that you did not bargain for. You did not ask for. I, I say life happens. I tell them all the time in Edmonton. Life happens to all of us. Holy Ghost talking, thumping, whatever. Life happens to you. No one is exempt from life's trials. So when stuff happens to us now, the enemy wants us to be ashamed, to sit in that embarrassment, to sit in that guilty and feel like the whole world is upon you. Woe is me. You feel like you're carrying the weight of the world on your shoulders. Can you really carry the weight of the world on your shoulders? You hear people say stuff like, I feel like the world's on my shoulders. Can you do that? People say stuff that they don't understand. Naomi, after losing her husband and her sons in the book of Ruth 1.20, and when she returned home to Bethlehem, and people say to Naomi, Naomi, welcome back. Everybody was excited to see Naomi. She had come back to Bethlehem. She came back with one daughter-in-law. The other daughter-in-law had gone, and the other sons had died. And everybody came and said, we welcome you, Naomi. And Naomi said, don't call me Naomi anymore. Don't call me Naomi, because Naomi means my joy. My joy. He said, don't call me my joy. Life has treated me harshly. Call me Mara. Because I am bitter at God. I am bitter in life. I am bitter in life because of things that have happened to me. So you see people, when you talk to them, they spew out negativity because they are bitter in life. Because stuff has happened to them. And they are mad. So Naomi was mad, literally mad. It's like, don't call me Naomi anymore. Why call me my joy? Nothing good ever happens to me. 
She didn't know that God, that her later years were going to be greater than her past. No matter what has happened to you, I've come this morning to tell you that hope that maketh not ashamed, the hope of Jesus, it makes you not ashamed. Doesn't matter where you grew up, what happened to you, what transpired in your past. If you have Jesus, the Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Behold, the old things are passed away. The word behold means look, gaze, stare. This is something new that God is making. So it doesn't matter what has happened in the past. God knows what has happened in the past. He is God after all. You don't have to announce it to him. People are ashamed because of their past. The things that nobody knows about. The stuff that nobody knows about that you know about yourself. So when people come to church, they're already struggling with some issues. It's not our job to come here and condemn them. I tell them in Edmonton, I say, I don't need to tell people what they're doing wrong because they know. They are not kids. I don't need to tell them what they are doing wrong. My job, I'm not the police. Don't think I'll be going on Facebook and policing. Where were you on Saturday? That's not my job. God hasn't called me to do that. I got two kids to play with and my wife. You know, I don't have time for that. I am not God. I'm just a servant of God. That's it. So I, I'm not here to police people and tell them what they're doing wrong. They already, they already know what they're doing wrong. When they come into the house of God, they need encouragement. They need hope. They need fuel to face another day. That's what they need. The Bible says there is now therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. There is no condemnation. It doesn't matter what you have done. There is forgiveness here. It doesn't matter what you have done. It doesn't matter where you come from. Whether you had abortions, whether you had extramarital affairs, nobody knows about. It doesn't matter when you come here, you can confess those sins. Our God is faithful and just to forgive you. You can move on with your life. You can begin again. God can erase your past. And he can make your later years to be fruitful. Yes. Like he was saying, God can accelerate your future. God can redeem the time. The Bible says we redeem the time for the days are evil. So God is in a process of acceleration because we have to redeem the time before Jesus comes. We have to win people for Christ. That's what it's all about. I tell people that the primary thing is to win people to Jesus Christ. Everything else is secondary. You getting a blessing is secondary. But the main thing is to get as many people to heaven with us. That's why we are here. That's why I told people, that's why I left Calgary to come to Edmonton. I, I wouldn't have come here even if you offered me a job that paid whatever. I didn't like Edmonton. <laughs> so actually when I also asked us, I said to my wife, Edmonton is in no way. <laughs> Talk about something else, no way. I said, I just, just just pray for a few days and we'll tell him later. So okay, we're gonna pray. The moment you said, yes, we're going to pray, God said, yes, I got you now. <laughs> we had no rest until we said yes. And the moment we said yes, there was peace in our lives again. Because we are in the will of God. Because if we had stayed in Calgary, the grace had lifted off this place for our lives. That's another matter. If you want to if you, if you re relocate to someone, come talk to me. I'll, I'll, I'll give you tips. I'll pray with you. The shame, people are afraid because of the shame of failure, rejection, makes people ashamed. Jesus took our shame. It was a shameful way to die on the cross. So you and I do not need to live in the shame of our past, in the shame of that abuse, whatever that happened to you. You don't need to live there. Yes, it happened. I'm not saying it did not happen. I, I acknowledge it happened. But you're not going to live your life because of something that happened 20 years ago. 
You know, you talk to believers, they'll say, you pastor, there's something that happened to me. You know, I need to tell you, we need to meet pastor. Say, Great, let's meet. And oh my God, pastor, this happened to me. I said, okay, my God, when did this happen? Are we talking about this happened last year? No, pastor, it happened in 1995. Like, oh Jesus. <laughs> and then you're going to put your face on and say, oh my God, Lord Jesus. <laughs> I hope they're not watching, you know. <laughs> I love my church, so thank you, Jesus. <laughs> You gotta enjoy it, evangelist. Otherwise, this thing can weigh you down, Pastor Kofi. You know what I'm talking about. What is this hope that maketh not ashamed? What is this hope we are talking about? Hope is a feeling of expectation. This is just from the dictionary, so don't think it's in the Bible. Hope is a feeling of expectation and a desire for a certain thing to happen. It is a feeling of trust, wanting something to happen. Did you get that? Hope is a feeling of expectation and a desire for a certain thing to happen. That's what hope is. It is a feeling of expectation. So I came this morning to raise somebody's hopes. Amen. I came to raise somebody's hopes. Somebody has decided they're, gonna, they're not going to believe God because they've believed for a long time and that thing has not come to pass. But I dare you this morning to believe God again. I dare you to believe God again. Because the enemy is after you believing God. It's after your belief system. If you, cannot be, if you cannot believe God, then the enemy is happy because nothing happens without faith. Nothing happens without faith. It is impossible to please God without faith. So faith becomes the prerequisite for you to receive what you are believing God for. So when I wake up in the morning, I wake up, I tell them in the morning, I wake up with an expectation. Say, today, Dr. Bailey, might just be the day that things will turn around. Today might just be the day that somebody, God will touch somebody and release a million dollars that belong to me. Today, Shatala Mosiah. Today might just be the day. Today. Today is the day that the Lord has made. Today, not tomorrow. Today. I didn't come to tell you about next month. I came to tell you about today. I came to, to raise your hopes up. If you're not going to get your, your hopes raised in church, where are they going to be raised? In the bar when they go, din, 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 you're going to bounce. Really? No, in the house of God, I'm came to raise your hopes up here. This hope we have, the Bible says in Hebrews 6 and 9, you can write this down. This hope we have is an anchor for the soul. It is firm and secure. The hope we have in Jesus is an anchor for our soul. It, it, it is firm and it is secure. Paul says when he writes in the book of Colossians, he says, be steadfast and movable. Be steadfast in this hope. So it doesn't matter what comes my way, I remain steadfast. I remain unmovable. I just keep showing up. I tell them, I show up at church, sometimes stuff is not working. And I'm preaching like, like, like everything is rolling in my life. Because I've made up my mind that stuff doesn't determine how I respond to God. My hope is firm. My hope is secure in the Lord Jesus. The Bible says Jesus is the hope of glory. In Colossians 1, 27, he is the hope of glory. So my hope is secure in him. So before you believe God for anything, you need to make sure that your hope is secure. That even if that thing doesn't come to pass, it doesn't shake your faith. You remain steadfast and movable. Somebody serving in the church disappeared for a few weeks and I went to see them. I, I found him and I said, what's going on? I don't see you in church. He's like, Pastor, I'm done, man. I'm done. I said, why? He said, I'm, I, I, everything keeps happening for everybody else but me. I'm, I'm so done with this thing. I said, God is not Santa Claus, dude. <laughs> that if he doesn't give you anything, you're mad. Let's grow up. Let's be mature in the faith. Where the stuff works or it doesn't work, God remains the same. The Bible says his faithfulness reaches unto the heavens. We keep serving him. We don't serve him for stuff. If stuff comes, we praise God. But if it doesn't come, you still find us jumping here with one suit, with whatever. We still praise God. Our hope needs to be secure, firm, anchored in God. Anchored in God. Because life has seasons there are seasons when things move. Sometimes st stuff doesn't move as fast in another season. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Paul says, preach 
to Timothy in season and out of season. That means when you feel like, when we don't feel like. I tell people, I don't, I don't worship God based on how I feel. That's an immature way of serving God. Because if I worship like that, one day you guys will come to church and find me not here. Because it's not every day that I feel like coming to church. I'm the pastor, but I don't feel like coming to church every Sunday, I'm telling you. And they were shocked. So because I'm just like you, I'm human, you know? But I'm, I'm past that realm of how I feel, Bethia. Yeah, I'm past that. It doesn't matter. I just put on my suit. I said, let's go to church. We're going to worship God today. When I get there, my feelings are lying. Yes, when the atmosphere is created, my feelings are lying. I said, now we're here. We're worshiping God. Shatal Abosaya. I want us to raise our hope antennas. And cause you to return to your stronghold of hope. Can you project from Zechariah 9.2? Hope is a stronghold. It is a force. It is a force. Zechariah says, return to the stronghold of hope. You prisoners of hope. Zechariah 9.2. Do you have 9? Is it 9? Yeah, 12. Sec. Turn you to the stronghold, you prisoners of hope. Even today do I declare that I will render double unto thee. Return you to the stronghold, you prisoners of hope. Believers, we ought to be people who are prisoners of hope. We ought to be in, in chains of hope. We live in the doldrums of hope. When people come to us in despair, when they are, when they are in contact with us, they are, they, they, it's, it's a contagious spirit. When they leave, they feel encouraged. They can leave feeling down when they have come into contact with you. You can leave feeling down when you have been in contact with Pastor Shaka. He's going he, he, to infect you with his encouragement. Shaka, Rabo, Taya. You feel like, oh my God, you, something is staring inside of you. That's how we ought to be. Because the Bible says we are prisoners of hope. So I came this morning to raise somebody's antennas of hope. Let hope arise inside of you. That desire, that expectation, let it arise again. The enemy wants you to stay in shame. The enemy wants you to stay in that defeated mentality. But I came to, to say, arise and shine, for thy light has come, and the glory of God has risen upon you. Arise, thy mighty man of God. Why sit there and die? The leper said, the leper said, why sit here and die? If we sit here, we die anyway. So we might as well arise and go into the enemy's camp. But believers will sit there and they want to die. But hope refuses to die. As long as I have breath in my lungs. I'm still alive. As long as I have breath, I can do something else. Today is a new day. Yesterday I fell flat on my face, but today I wake up again and say, I'm back again. You didn't finish me yesterday, devil. You should have finished me because I'm back again today. Come on, bring me what you got. What do you have? Bring me what you got. Pa, give me what you got. Pa, give me what you got. Pa, what do you have? Life will throw you to the ropes. It will do that sometimes. Circumstance, you find yourself hanging there like Mike Tyson. <laughs> They've given you blow after blow, you've got nothing left. You've got to be like Muhammad Ali, you know? <laughs> you're getting me worked up, man. Thank God I'm still young so I can run. <laughs> when things work or don't work, you just dig in and say, I live in hope. I dwell in hope, I abide in hope, and I will not be ashamed. Yeah. That's what you dig in. You just dig in there. Yeah. You just dig in. You just put on your makeup. You make it seem like it's working out. You put on that wig. You come to church. You say, you know what? It's working out for my good. Come on now. You just, you, you just show up. The just shall live by faith. Yes, come on now. You just show up. You don't hide. The enemy wants you to hide. Because when you hide now, that's when he finishes you off. 
The enemy wants to isolate you. When he isolates you, he knows you got no help. But when you come here and you fall down, you have brothers and sisters. We are our brother's keeper. We are there for one another. The Bible says he puts the solitary in families. That's what God does. This is your family. This is your house. Come here. When things are hard, put put somebody aside. You know what? I just feel like I can't go. Can you pray for me? When you leave, you feel encouraged. I know God will never leave us nor forsake us. In Job 13 verse 15, Job said, Though he slay me, yet will I praise him. Job was determined. Job was persuaded. I want you to catch that word. Job was persuaded. I love that word Paul uses in, in Romans. says, I am persuaded. The word persuaded means I am convinced. I am convinced. Nobody can tell me otherwise. You have to come to a place where you say, nobody can tell me otherwise. I believe this God. Yes, I believe this God. Come rain, come snow, whatever. It doesn't matter. I'm staying here. I'm staying. I'm not moved by what I see. Because what I see is temporary. It is subject to change. That storm that you see is temporary. It's not going to last forever. But the enemy wants you to make it seem like it's going to last forever. It won't last forever. Winter doesn't last forever. It might get as cold, whatever, however you feel. But eventually spring shows up. Eventually spring shows up. When spring shows up, we take on the lighter jackets. And then summer comes, we, th- we throw out the lighter jacket, we put on the shorts. Yeah. We go to the beach. <laughs> you should come to Edmonton. That's how I preach in Edmonton. So you should come and visit Edmonton. Yeah. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people, both now and forevermore. God surrounds his people. He surrounds you and I. I'm going to start to close now. His promises are yes and amen. 2 Corinthians 1.20. His promises are yes and amen. I've come this morning because there's some people in this place that have had so much no's in their lives. You heard me. Some people have had so much no's in their lives. That they can't believe that there's a yes in their life. Yes, we have decided to offer you that job. Yes, you are the one that we have picked. Yes, you are the candidate for this thing. Some people haven't heard that word yes in a long time. Doors keep shutting in their face. A few, a few months ago, I, I came to church and I declared, I said, we are in a season of yeses now. I said, we are in a season of yeses, and somebody, somebody caught that word. Yes. And a few, uh, uh, two, two weeks or three weeks, they came and testified. I said, when pastor declared that we are in a season of yes, I caught that word. Amen. Because when a word is prophesied, somebody has to catch that prophecy. Yes. Yes. So this, he caught that word, and there was a job that he applied for, and he applied, and he went for an interview. They said, oh, we've taken, after a week, said, we've taken somebody else. And a week later, they put another job, same company, and he was underqualified. He said, Pastor, do you think I should apply? I said, go ahead and apply again. What are you going to lose anyway? If they don't respond to you, nothing changes. You still have your job, you still have your life. What's, what's the worst that could happen? Let's just apply. I said, let's believe God. We're in a season of yeses. We prayed and we believe God. And he came back a week later he, and, and came back and said, Pastor, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. I, they, they gave me that job. They said, you are not the most qualified, but we, we feel you are the right candidate for this job. Yay! Shatala makasaya. We feel you're the right candidate for this job. There was a yes in his life that was due. It was due. It had to come to pass. So I have come this morning to declare some yeses in somebody's life. The expectation of the righteous will not be cut off. Proverbs 23, 18. I want to declare some yeses in your life. I want to pray and agree with some people in this place who have been believing God for some tender, some big moolah, some big money. Big money. Yes, big money. And when the big money come, come and give an offering to the man of God right there. He's laboring and toiling. Some things, let me, let me tell you, some things don't need prayer, they need a seed. 
A few months ago, I was turning 40. Pastor Carl. And somebody called me from church and said, Pastor, we know you're turning 40 today. We want to bless you with your family. Take your family out for dinner and stuff. And I had no money. I said, thank you, Jesus. You're so good. <laughs> they said, check your email. They sent me an email transfer. And they, I said, let me pray for whatever you desire. Let me pray for what you desire. In a month or two, the lady was pregnant. But we had been praying six, seven months before nothing happened. The moment she planted a seed... Apostle was there a few weeks ago and said, man of God, there are some things that don't need prayer. Some things, sometimes they need baptism, sometimes they just need a seed. That's all. So there are some things, maybe you're believing God for a breakthrough. The man of God right here is here. Doesn't matter how much, come and sow a seed and say, Pastor, pray for me. I'm believing God for this tender. It's not, it's not about the amount, it's about honoring him. When you honor him, God is a God of, who, who, who is a God of order. He respects honor. I was saying to somebody, sometimes you just need, just call him for dinner or something. He can take himself for dinner. He doesn't need your money. This man is well loaded. Don't worry about it. But you are honoring him. When God came to Abraham, when God came to Abraham, the first thing Abraham and Sarah did, they fed him. After they fed him, God said, by this time, next year, Sarah will have a child. He didn't prophesy until he had been fed. So I, I don't leave here so I can say these things, Pastor, because I'm going home soon. So I can say it for you. But it's about honor. It's about honor. The anointing that, that you do not honor, you cannot eat from it. If you think, ah, just Pastor JB, you're going to get the Pastor JB blessing. Ah, it's just Pastor JB, we have known him. He's a man of God. As much as we honor Apostle, we honor him because Apostle anointed him and set him in this house. So, I, wanted to say, I didn't need to say that, but God wanted me to say that. I want to pray and agree with some people in this house for some yeses in your life. The Bible says, I want us to touch and agree concerning some things you are believing God. In Matthew 18, 19, whatsoever things we touch and agree on, whatsoever things we touch and agree on. So I'm believing God for some yeses that as we pray with the pastors and we touch and agree with you, whatever it is, whether you're believing God for a child, whether you're believing God for a promotion, whether you're believing God for that business to take off, whatever it is you're believing God for, we are in a season of yeses. And then recently God gave me a word that now we are in a season of, can you project from this the last one, uh, Hebrews 11 verse 1. Hebrews 11, verse 1, in, in, in whatever version, but especially KJV if you can. There it is. It says, now faith is. We are in a season, I declare to the house, we are in a season of now. Amen. Now. Because now is not tomorrow. Now is not next year. Now is now. Yeah. When, when, when somebody says, let's do it now, there's an agency to it, right? Yeah. When you tell you, to, stop it. Do it now. It's an agency. It's, it, it, it's a timing to it. So God said, now. We're in a season of now. Whatever you believe in God for, this is a season of manifestation is now. Amen. Now. Because next year, when you're doing next year, what you're trying to do, you're trying to, 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 to stretch your faith. You don't want to believe God. You say, oh, you know, maybe it's too hard. What if it doesn't come to pass? Don't worry about that. Just believe God. Your job is to believe God. Amen. Jesus said someone when he was healing people, he would say to them, according to your faith, let it be so. Amen. According to your faith. And they receive whatever it is that they were believing God for, according to their faith. So I wonder if I have somebody who is believing God for some now manifestation. Amen. Now manifestation, some stuff that you've been believing God for, and you put a time frame to those things, and they have not come to pass. But now is the season. Now. Now faith is the substance of things hopeful, the evidence of things not seen. Now, not tomorrow, not next year, now. Whoever is sitting on whatever belongs to you. Two years ago, before I left, I had a gentleman in church here, and we were, he said, Pastor, I'm praying for my papers. 
They've been sitting there for two years, three years. They've been keeping postponing, telling me, oh, we're working on it, we're working on it. I said, okay, now we're going to pray. So now we're going to pray that whoever is processing those papers, God will give them no rest until they contact you. God will give them no rest. It was around May. It was around June or something. By the time we got to August, we're about to leave. He came to me. He was helping me move and say, Pastor, you won't believe it. My papers are in process now. They send me the letters. Things are in motion. Because that's what we do. The enemy, the enemy wants to keep you in what I call the spirit of delay. That's why he was speaking about accelerated delay. We're stuff just, just, just stagnant. It doesn't move. And we, we take it as believers. Sometimes you need to command and declare some things. You need to declare some things. The Bible says, decree a thing and it shall be so. Decree a thing and it shall be so. So I'm closing. It's 10 to, uh, I'm good with time, man. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm closing now. I'm going to call. The first altar call I'm going to call is wherever I go. I make sure I do this. If you are in this place this morning, let's close our eyes. If you are in this place this morning and you have never made the decision to allow Jesus to be the Lord of your life, I'm going to extend an invitation to you. This is probably the most important thing that we're going to do in this service is to give you an opportunity to respond to your Savior, is to give you an opportunity to say yes to Jesus. If you've never confessed Him as your Lord and Savior, I want to extend that opportunity to you this morning. If you are in this place and you have never received Jesus, I'm going to ask you to lift up your hand. Lift up your hand if you are in this auditorium this morning. Lift up your hand. Lift up your hand if you say, I want Jesus. I want Jesus in my life. I want Jesus in my life. Amen. Amen. Everybody's born again. Let's give God a hand clap. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. But if there are people in this place, I want to tie my faith with your faith so we can believe God together. I want us to touch and agree for whatever it is that you're believing God for so we can declare some yeses in your life that in the next few days, in the next week or two, we start hearing testimony. Come and testify to the house what God has done in your life. The Bible says that testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So when you testify of what Jesus has done, you are prophesying into somebody's life. What you are saying is that God can do it again. If he did it for me, he can do it for you. So if you are here under the sound of my voice and you are believing God for something and it's been, it's been months, it's been years, whatever it is, you can come to these altars. The pastors are here and I'm here. We're going to pray. We're going to touch and agree and we're going to believe God that God will release some yeses. Stuff that's been sitting idle, somebody sitting on your papers, somebody sitting on your contract, somebody sitting on your business loan, somebody sitting on your mortgage. We're going to pray and believe God. Jesus says, I have come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. We're going to pray for the Zoe, the God kind of life, that acceleration would happen in your life and stuff will start to move. The God we serve, like Pastor says, He takes us from glory to glory, from one dimension to another dimension. He doesn't keep us in one place. He doesn't keep us in one place. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Let's pray for them, pastors. Let's pray for them. You can sing something for us. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Do you need some oil on? Hallelujah. Let's pray for them. Let's pray for them. Let's come and agree with them. Let's come and agree with them.
Open the floodgates of heaven. Let it rain. Open the floodgates of heaven. Let it rain. Open the floodgates of heaven. Let it rain. Let it rain. Open the floodgates of heaven. 